Hi, this is James Joker with Web Comics Reviews and Interview. Tonight we're looking at superhero tropes and how to abuse them. So sit back, relax, and let the Geek Fest begin. Alright. The obligatory for doing this to people who are just catching on. One of the hardest problems with any writer is to basically get readers to suspend their disbelief. The easiest way to do this is to create some feeling of familiarity that is some sort of touchstone that they can keep coming back to and well as long as they've got something familiar for them you can pretty much take them wherever you want to sort of like you know if you have this really cool lake and you're trying to get people to go go into it well use a boat everybody knows what a boat is that boat is a very small area where they can be ultra familiar ultra comfortable with and therefore you can have anything in the lake you want you know, you've got this familiarity, you've got this weirdness, and by combining the two, you can have the readers do pretty much anywhere you want them to go. One of the ways you set this neat little boat up is you use well-known tropes. Obviously, the superhero genre has a lot of well-known tropes and a lot of weirdness into it that you, as a writer, have to allow for. Before we get going, I'm going to point out that if you do want to work on a superhero genre, you're going to have to set up some rationale for the superpowers and why they've been physics. More importantly, you're going to have to be ultra consistent with how these physics work. Yeah, you can have them, each individual character has been the laws in their own weird way, but you have to have some sort of overarching something. Um... Marvel Comics with their mutants, for example. DC with the Metagene. And then, of course, when you display the powers, each of those real person is going to have to be consistent with how they display their powers. Even if they have a wide range of powers, as long as they have some sort of common umbrella, it's all powers available, you're good to go. So, consistency is your friend when it comes to doing these weird genres, so keep that in mind. The more consistent you are, the easier it is for the readers to spend their disbelief. And once you have that going for you, you can do pretty much whatever you want. That said, there's a number of tropes that are familiar to pretty much all comic book readers and writers. And, well, let's get to it, shall we? Let's start off with groups. At some point or another, every superhero is going to be part of one group or another. There just doesn't work out that well if you only have one superhero. I mean, there are some universes where that's true, don't get me wrong. But if you're going to have multiple heroes, well, eventually they're going to join some sort of group, even if it's a loose alliance. In in fact, don't keep in mind that even you know that every member of a group has to be super powered. In a lot of ways, you can have a wide variety of strengths and weaknesses in a particular group. For that matter, you can have one actual superhero and a lot of non-powered people backing that superhero. The basic gist is that you just simply see a lot of groups when it comes to superheroes. The big obvious advantage is good old-fashioned mutual defense. That is, instead of having every individual hero looking out for themselves, they've got people that have their back. When it comes to setting up defensive situations, this cannot be beat. I mean, it's just straight up. You've got a couple of friends you know that have your back. Even if it's a limited situation, um, you, the group is going to be able to do a lot more. Which, of course, brings up the pulling resources. Sort of look at, I mean, I hate bringing up the obvious, but look at um, DC's Justice League of America. You've got Superman, who pretty much is an investigator with a lot of powers. You've got Batman, who may be, is one of the top-notch strategists of the DC Universe, but he's also got one of the biggest bank accounts in the DC Universe. There are a lot of people who list money as his actual power. Wonder Woman. Powers who are actually almost as diverse as Superman if you actually start looking around. 
but she also has her own connections in there, plus she has diplomatic immunity as a envoy of Themyscira. You know, any one of the Screen Lanterns, Hal Jordan, um, John Stewart, Kyle Rayner, even Gnort. Yeah, that's a fun one. Heck, even Guy Gardner. That ring of them gives them a tremendous amount of power, plus gives them access to a lot of information that nobody else has. Which is sort of, you know, you basically have Wikipedia at your literal fingertip. Now imagine all those different resources pulled into one. Yes, Cyborg, we're also looking at you because you can go into the internet and find weird stuff and hack whatever you need to hack. Just like, well, actually even better than Batman can. So yeah, these groups have a lot of resources they can pull in, which means they can deal with pretty much any problem. Now, mainly this may create problems for you as the writer, but at the same time, if you establish that they have various weaknesses they also have to deal with, um, hey. And then, of course, there's the availability issue. You know? You're not always Green Lantern. He's going to have his own missions he has to deal with. Batman has Gotham to contend with. Superman even has a writing career he has to contend with. And, of course, there's inner family politics like what Wonder Woman is dealing with all the time. In short, yeah, they've got a lot more resources, but they've also got a lot more challenges. It's just a matter of figuring out how to balance those two out. <laughs> the other advantage, of course, is that you can have a situation where you have somebody out on vacation and the others have to pull their weight. You can even bring in reserve members. So, in other words, you've got a really cool thing. You can actually have a rotating cast. Which, of course, has its own advantages. I mean, yeah, it's sort of cool to have a situation where you're building up the same basic characters each and every time you go out. But eventually, you're going to want to have a little bit of fun. Well, have Batman, Superman, and Wonder Woman go off to a spa together. All of a sudden, and of course, Green Lantern is doing his own thing. Well, Cyborg has got to call in some reserves and... They've got to deal with many problems that come up. So not only does it allow you to show the how wide how diverse this group is, but it also basically allows you to give some of the characters time off, which can be a major advantage in terms of keeping them fresh and you know just allows you to have some fun with it. Flip side of course, you're going to have the dreaded criminal organization. For every Justice League, you have a Justice of Doom. Well, obviously not only does this provide a lot of the advantages of the superhero organization in terms of, of uh, you know, mutual defense and pulling the resources, which of course means that they can pull off greater crimes. You know, Lex Luthor, Gorilla Grodd, and Brainiac all helping each other on the same crime all of a sudden elevates it from taking on the U.S. to maybe taking on a small solar system. Or if they simply want to break into Fort Knox, well, nobody's really going to be able to stop them. So greater power, or more accurately, access to a wider range of powers, allows for greater crimes. At the same time, you can also take some of those smaller villains and throw them up as distractions. I mean, you've got some actually decent characters out there that you can just simply say, hey, we don't really want you, but we do need to get all the superheroes over to this one area. So you send a couple of those little second-tier villains over to another area, you've got a really great distraction that superheroes can't afford to basically ignore. And while they're being over there distracted, you go over and do this big crime. You know, obviously, being able to trade information is another advantage. You know, you've got all these various villains that belong to all these various rogue galleries of all these different heroes. Well, you get them onto one area, you're going to create two situations that really make life hell for the superheroes. Not only can they trade information in terms of uh, secret identities, 
what they know about, which can actually lead to busting the secret identities, as well as, you know, basically just general information about how things work as far as the superheroes go. But, they can also trade information on more other things, like if one of them is heavy in the government, and one of them is a scientist, the two of them combining, she would links between the government and the science science work worlds, well, that can be a really nasty combination in and of itself. So, in essence, you get a group of the villains together, you're creating a much bigger, nastier tr- trouble for whoever your superheroes are. Let's not forget that law enforcement groups are all over the place as well. Not only are these going to be able to link your various. Actually, let's take a step back on this because law enforcement can help the bad guys just as much as you can help the good guys. That is, if we throw secret identities into the mix and a few other things, we've got a situation where even though the law enforcement is trying to help the good guys defeat the bad guys, the bad guys can use law enforcement organization as the, another area to, well, get resources from either directly in terms of money as well as stealing things from the evidence locker or the equivalent, or they can also take advantage of the research that the law enforcement does. I mean, I hate looking over at uh, Marvel for a sec, but look at S.H.I.E.L.D. You've got, not only do you have a lot of people that are doing law enforcement in S.H.I.E.L.D., but you've also got a lot of people that are breaking down how superpowers work, as well as taking out those really cool alien devices, as well as super science, and breaking them down as well. Could you imagine what would happen if a superhero, a supervillain got a hold of that information? And yeah, they commonly do, so we don't really have to do all that much guessing, do we? Flip side, of course, this also provides a rallying point for your superheroes because a lot of these law enforcement organizations also have their own groups of superheroes. So, and not only that, but they also provide support for acknowledged groups of superheroes that ally with them frequently. The alliance between the Avengers and S.H.I.E.L.D. is arguably one of the scariest out there because of how powerful the two groups are. So, you know, if all of a sudden... S.H.I.E.L.D. is having a problem. They call up Captain America. Say, hey, we need you guys to do this. Cap's like, sure. Later on, Cap's like, hey, uh, we're having a little bit of a personnel problem. We can't cover this situation. You guys are going to have to do it. But here's some information for you. You know? You all of a sudden, that law enforcement becomes a clearinghouse for information. As well as another resource that everybody else can use. Sometimes unwittingly. Um, Just strictly a side note, if you're trying to do a dystopic type of uh, environment as well, having an overbearing law enforcement organization actually is not a bad thing to have in your world. This also means that you're going to have somebody who's going to be able to track crimes a lot better. Just look at some of this, you know, Batman and Cyborg are, have all these really cool hacking abilities. Now imagine if they have all these different law enforcement organizations that are already tracking crimes all over the place. Well, the various law enforcement organizations aren't going to have all the pieces of the puzzle. But these independent superheroes are going to be able to take all these different pieces and put them together in weird ways. So all of a sudden you're going to have a lot more crimes getting solved. You know, even if it's just incidentally, you know, like I found this serial killer who we thought was somebody else, but we notice he's also doing crimes in this other way here, so here's a pattern for you, as well as a profile. Enjoy. Meantime, I've got to go distru- do something about this world beater over here. Thank you. You're welcome. This also, of course, allows you a way to manage your supers, because almost all these little Law enforcement organizations are, of course, going to have their own files on all these different heroes and villains in the area. Well, remember what I said about Clearinghouse? This is another advantage of that. By taking advantage of your law enforcement organization, who, of course, is interested in tracking all your various vigilantes, heroes, and villains, and, of course, they're going to have access to all this in one small area. 
not necessarily a bad thing. Especially if you're trying to basically uh, coordinate something between various different groups. All of a sudden, your law enforcement organization, which is already set up to manage their own people doing a lot of different things, just simply had to take a lot of the heroes under their wing for a little bit. And all of a sudden, you've got this really cool situation where you've got the law enforcement organization acting as a dispatcher. Which, when combined with the various superhero groups, you're going to be able to deal with a lot of problems a lot faster and a lot more efficiently. Uh, so all of a sudden, those big, huge, you know, summertime conflicts where everybody gets drawn into them, you know, have everybody be part or access to the same law enforcement organization, to the same basic superhero groups, and all of a sudden it gets really weird really quick. And not necessarily in a bad way. Of course, if you want to have the super villain throw a wrench into this situation, just infiltrating the batch system could create some really bad situations. But that's just something to play with on your own. Now, obviously, the heroes are you know, sort of a look at themselves. There's two, actually a couple of different ways of doing superheroes. The obvious way is to have the superheroes be symbolic representations of different belief systems. Um, Superman, you know, obviously is truth, justice in the American way. Batman, more of somewhere between, is the debate between revenge and justice. Spider-Man, will always be the local boy done good. Wonder Woman, obviously female power. You can basically see how a lot of the bigger heroes, well, the bigger the hero, the bigger the metaphor. Sort of an interesting way of looking at things, but, you know, that can bring into its own conflicts. Uh, just notice how often Batman and Superman go at it. Because you've got somebody who believes in total due process and versus somebody who... Well, doesn't. I mean, sure, he gives a lot of lip service to it and he fills Arkham Asylum, but Batman is an vigilante who's at it, definitely more of a justice person than he is a by-the-book person. So, having everybody be a metaphor actually sort of works out to your advantage. Um, that said, heroes don't become heroes just because, well, they got superpowers heroes are the reason they're set up is because well they have their own motivation the most basic motivation is basically to serve greater good of society this is where you have a lot of your heroes come in and pretty much do what they can which in and of itself isn't bad it means you know knights are always going to be popular people who go out and essentially serve the common good, either because of some sense of noblesse oblige, or just because they feel it's the right thing to do. So serving morals is definitely going to be a major motivator. You're also going to have people that are there to test themselves. You know, I can't really get enough challenge in the normal fields, but if I go after super villains... I can become the best, I can become the brightest, and I can show this to other people. More importantly, even if they're doing it to test themselves, you know, becoming a superhero isn't the worst thing you can do. And just think of how many people in the real world do things just to see if they can do stuff. You know, extreme sports addicts, for example. Or Olympic athletes. They don't become the best at what they are because they basically decide, hey, I'm really happy in with where I'm at. No, they decided to go out and test themselves against other people. And when you've got a superhero looking for supervillains that will give him a challenge, again, another really great motivator. Um, some people do it just so they feel useful. These are people that would probably be ultra-depressed because they just simply... You know, it's just everybody likes to feel like they're part of something. You want to deal with depression? Join a group that's doing something. And so you've got these heroes out there that occasionally will do things just so they feel 
needed. They feel useful. Not all that common, and these people probably find their own support groups. But it's, again, a really great way of looking at seeing if, you know, different motivations for different heroes. And, of course, you've got the academics. These are the people who became superheroes because, well, being part of a superhero group gives them the opportunity to go out and explore weird things. These are people that are either working on some sort of thesis, uh, for example, uh, people who are into researching mutants. I mean, just look at how many X-Men are actually bio majors. Professor X himself has a PhD. Um, Henry McCoy, multiple PhD. At one point, you actually had almost a dozen X-Men whose big thing was just simply researching the mutant gene. Now, throw in other characters like Adam Strange, who likes exploring areas. And, well, you've got a lot of people who are not just there to prove themselves, but to catalog the weirdness of the universe as a whole, or to specifically try to solve certain specific problems. You know, the academics, like I said. These are really great people to work with. So, you take all that, throw a really bad twist on it, you've got the dreaded villains. The villains, not, well, let's first off look at the dark side of the motivations we just looked at. Some villains will go after superheroes because, again, easiest way to test themselves. Some villains become who they are because they've decided that the best way to help defend the universe is to take it over. Some people are actually trying to determine their own re- research the wor- weird. In other words, they're the academics as well. But instead of trying to do it for the personal curiosity or because they have some sort of, they think it might end up helping humanity to have this catalog running around, they're doing it specifically so they can find the power spots and possibly up their own personal control of the universe. You don't really see a lot of villains doing it just so they can feel useful, but you do have the tag-alongs. The people who would probably be, I don't know, coffee shop regulars. But hey, I've got superpowers. You've got superpowers. Let me tag along just because. However, you've also got those that see themselves as a test of humanity. Basically, I'm here. And I'm either going to increase the skills of humanity or I'm going to weed out the shaft. You know, you've actually got quite a few villains that do exactly that. Their idea of strengthening the population is to get rid of the weaker parts. And the best way you can do that is by testing humanity as a general whole. Some of them just need chaos. You know, I don't really care about who wins or who loses. I just want to have fun. I want to break the rules. I want to twist the rules to the point where I show that they actually are broken. Yeah, they're generally jerks, but I really hate the chaos villains. (gasps) Um, Obviously, you're going to have those that are going after the power, going after the money. And these are not necessarily the same thing. You do have a lot of villains who just simply want to get rich and you know, enjoy the luxury life. That's it. They want money. Being a villain is just the way to do it. And obviously, you're going to have those who want to go after world domination. Of course, there are those who just circular street. That's fine too. That's coming into it. And of course, if we've got heroes that are going after justice, we're going to have villains that are going strictly after revenge. And not big society changing but just petty in this sense don't forget that just as you have heroes that are big giant metaphors you have villains that are pretty much the same way so if that helps and while we're at it let's not forget the dreaded sidekicks originally sidekicks were set up to allow kids to have some sort of point of view character into the comic that is just as you had Batman and you could have Robin who would basically be the kid's avatar 
Well, the problem with this is that this is a situation where things got a little bit overthunk. That is, if you're a ten-year-old boy, you don't want to be Robin. You want to be Batman. You know. Yeah, it's sort of going to be cool later on to realize that Robin was an option, but generally you're going to be seeing a lot of people who Batman. You know, Robin is more of an annoying. However, in the actual comic book world itself, sidekicks actually do provide a really spectacular group of services. Um, not only do they give a different perspective of it as well, I mean, that naivety that the sidekicks are known for actually is useful in and of itself in terms of trying to solve problems. So having somebody who's basically not bound to the general same solutions that everybody else is, that is a literal fresh pair of eyes, isn't necessarily a bad thing to have on your team. At the same time, they can be used as a, you know, if you want to have a superhero who has a thing of tradition going on, then a sidekick can be seen as a way to continue that tradition. You know, the Knight Squire, as it were. By training, the, by training the sidekick in the same way that the superhero thinks, you can continue on that tradition of heroism that the hero obviously has started, or is a long lineage of. On the other hand, if you really want to look at things in a weird way, they can also be a backup. Or more accurately, a way to counter the superhero if something interesting happens to the hero. In fact, Batman almost exclusively trains Robins with that in mind. In this situation, you have the hero recognizes that if he goes out of control, there could be really bad repercussions to the world in general. I mean, imagine somebody with Batman's wealth, martial arts power, or prowess, and general technological value, abilities, all of a sudden doing things for evil. At that point, having some sort of contingency is not necessarily a bad thing. And if you have somebody who's trained specifically to take out the superhero, so much the better. So, yeah, Batman seems to be a little on the paranoid side, but it usually works out for everybody else. There's also the situation that occasionally you want to have those, those kind of skills and knowledges, uh, you know, kept around. Training the super, training the sidekick in those knowledges and abilities keeps the, you know, basically the sidekick becomes a backup. That is, if something bad happens to the hero, you still got all that wealth and or that wealth of information is still going to be have some sort of representative. Ergo. Again, the sidekick. This works really great when we start looking at superpowers that are, you know, that are transferred versus genetics. Um, going off a weird one, My Hero Academia has the, uh, with their sparks and all that, actually has a way to, has the, you know, with All Might, actually passes down their powers and the more it gets passed around, the more powerful the person is. So you've got Deku is actually being trained to take over All Might's position at some point. And of course, to pass on the power eventually and he is on his own. For those of you running knight or mage type characters, again with characters that are dependent on the information being passed from one generation to the next, the sidekicks are a great way of throwing something in. Um, the major thing to keep in mind on sidekicks before we get going on more else is keep in mind they don't have to be a pubescent juvenile. A lot of sidekicks are actually almost as powerful as the hero. Some sidekicks are actually almost, actually more powerful than the hero in a lot of ways and they've just decided to apprentice with the hero in order to learn certain things. So in that regard, as long as you basically look at the sidekick as being trained at, by the hero, it creates for some really interesting situations, especially when you start allowing for more powerful sidekicks. You know, I'm people are sidekicks in name only type of deal. 
it does not have to be some scrawny male child that's just basically, you know, they cut stealing their hubcaps or something. There can actually be somebody who's decided to come in, study under the hero as to further his own skills. It definitely would make for an interesting dynamic. Weaknesses is another interesting aspect of the uh, superhero genre. A lot of times these make sort of a weird sense. That is, if you have an elemental type of character, have them, having them be weak to the opposite element, you know, sort of can make for some interesting drama. You know, if you've got a guy who's a flamethrower, a living flamethrower, having him have any weakness to water, besides making sense, actually can throw some really great dramatic into the situation. Um, on the flip side, you've also got the situation where the f flaws are of the power. I mean, you've got a lot of mut mutants out there, for example, that under normal situations, having their particular power set is actually a weakness. It just happens to be found an interesting way of applying it. Scott Summers, aka Cyclops, he lost part of his uh, part of his brain has been damaged, so he has no control over his optic blast. Well, under normal situations, having a optic blast continually coming forward is a definite disadvantage. You know. Um, Rogue's ability. She touches people, she gains their abilities, but she also makes them fall asleep. Again, normally speaking, and this caused her a lot of romantic problems over the years. So, I mean, they figure out ways to combat it. For example, Magneto, in one alternate universe, coated himself with a magnetic, basically what amounts to a magnetic skin, and was able to keep her power at bay that way. But let's get real, there's a lot of really cool powers that have a lot of interesting drawbacks to them. Uh, if you've got somebody, for example, who's a radiation thrower, he's always going to leak a little bit of background radiation and cause cancer. Sort of like what they tried to do with Dr. Manhattan, but they actually, there actually is a radiation issue. Um, there's also the dreaded program limit concept. Basically, you can only use your power for so long, or under certain situations. And in some cases, this is actually how the power works. For example, for example, Sunspot's got this really cool power where you can take solar radiation and basically convert it to, to physical strength. The only problem is that he's got a limitation in that he needs to have absorbed or being constantly in sunlight in order to use his ability. Really cool power, really nasty limitation. And you actually see this in a lot of other superheroes. Others can't use their power in certain situations. Um, others need certain other qualifications in order to use their powers. You know, Rogue, for example, even though she has a really... A, good number of baseline powers with her invulnerability in her flight, for example, as well as super strength, her power requires her to be somebody else in the area that she can drain. Otherwise, she's basically just a normal flying brick. Not saying that's a bad thing in and of itself, but she can't use the full range of her powers without there actually being somebody there she can actually drain from. There's also, of course, the dreaded rule of trade-offs. In essence, you can have a huge amount of power, but there's going to be something, some sort of limiting factor. Um, the Hulk. Incredible amounts of strength, but he has to trade off his intelligence to get there. I mean, Banner, Banner is inarguably one of the top brains of the Marvel Universe, but he can't access that intelligence as a Hulk. So you have that trade-off between intelligence and strength. Um, other characters work on similar concepts. That is, they've got some really cool advantages, but they've also got some really nasty disadvantages. 
again, going back to the flamethrower, uh, Prince Nemoor is another example. Really great character, but needs to get in touch with the water every so often. Same thing with Aquaman in that regard. Um, Green Arrow. Really great archer. His limitation is that he actually needs a bow and a set of arrows. I mean, yeah, he's got some great combat skills, don't get me wrong, but the bow and arrow is pretty much his thing. Even with Green Lantern, even ignoring the uh, Yellow Flaw, for example, which, by the way, is sort of an interesting discussion in of itself because originally the Flaw actually made the Green Lantern able to use the green energy in order to create constructs as well as other things. Well, eventually that con that limitation was dealt with, but you know you've still got the fact that originally at one point they couldn't do anything to anything yellow. And that's because of a flaw within the ring itself. Which is sort of an interesting and cool concept to play around with. I'm just trying to point out that if you can basically come up with a superpower and you can actually figure out ways that there are weaknesses to that power, you'll actually only create a lot more interesting character. Scott Summers is probably the ringleader here. He's got this really cool optic blast that allows him to go through pretty much everything. But he's also got to figure out ways to limit that every so often. Um, and if he doesn't have a way to limit it, well, he basically has to do with the fact that he's basically blind. Or he's going to kill pretty much anybody in front of him. So, weaknesses may sound a little silly, but they actually do have some good old-fashioned dramatic reasons for them. Basically, you don't get nothing for you don't get something for nothing. And challenging, finding weaknesses for the strengths is part of that cost. Okay, since so we've got all these different people together, they obviously have to meet somewhere. Ergo, we've got superhero bases. Now, obviously, those superhero bases are going to be a really great place for all these heroes to basically train you know, get all their information together, so on and so forth. Basically, all the really cool advantages of being in a group are magnified when they've actually got somewhere they can count on to meet on a regular basis. Well, the base also tends to be relatively easy to defend. For one thing, you've got all these superheroes that actually live there 24-7. You know, a superhero base is probably not the world's greatest place to go after. Having a base also means that the superhero group can set up permanent structures. Uh, Cerebro, for example, for the X-Men. Or the, you know, or if you want to set up some sort of computer that basically helps law enforcement act as its own clearinghouse of information, that can be set up here as well. A base also allows the heroes access to bigger toys. In other words, they don't have to, they're not just limited to, say, whatever car they can get their hands on, but they can actually store their big big jets there as well. Um, so in essence, not only does the base allow them to fully connect and basically really take advantage of their pulled resources, but it also allows them to grow as a team as well, you know, with the training and various maintenance of their abilities, but it also allows them to basically build bigger and better things. And if you really want fun, keep in mind, if you have all these really cool toys and all this really cool information in one area, why wouldn't the supervillains come by and try to take it every so often? Or heck, if it's, con it's a major source of power, why not try to blow it up every so often just be sure that you could? Yeah, villains are not very nice people. An interesting question that keeps coming up with a lot of superheroes is... Why don't they spread a lot of the super science around? I mean, obviously, you've got... When you start looking at the superhero versus... Well, actually, let me take a step back. If you see a lot of superheroes, you're going to see a lot of super science. You know, Tony Stark's power armor. Spider-Man's web shooters. Pretty much everything about Black Panther. And we won't get into Batman. Heck, we won't even talk about some of the really cooler stuff like... 
the access of the purple healing ray that Wonder Woman has. Well, you know, this is obviously not trickled down to the regular people. I mean, to a certain degree it has, don't get me wrong, but generally speaking, all this really cool super science is just simply not accessible by most of the average people. There actually can be some really good reasons for this. I like it's way too expensive or it relies on something that's really rare. In other words, your average person is not going to be able to really access it because, you know, it just doesn't make sense for them given their income brackets and all that. Or it could be relying on a certain superpower or super, a certain techniques that has to be taught and takes a long time to learn. And Millie, you tend to see this more with a martial arts thing. But you also have people that have certain very specific powers that tend to get used to power machines. Um, an obvious example, relatively obvious example is somebody who has the ability to shift between worlds. They actually do have certain items that are key to that ability and can actually magnify it or make it more specific. In the hands of an average person, it's basically useless because they don't have the ability to shift between worlds. But this applies to other characters as well. Like, um, if I have the ability to magnify laser beams, but I require a certain rare substance to do so, you know, I've got that issue as well. It's just you're going to find out that a lot of the super science just tends to be out of the range of the average person. Either because it's required powers, um, that just costs too much, it has some sort of really rare element, or even because it's location, it's only workable at that particular location. Again, that's a more of a magic only thing, but you've seen a lot of science fiction, a lot of science fiction toys as well. And of course, there's the dreaded Earth's focus. You know, you basically have all these universes where Earth is pretty much the place to be, for whatever reason. Whereas you can put various plot-based elements in there. Like, for example, Earth is the one of the few places where you can find a particular element. Or, it happens to be a dimensional nexus, and that just simply makes it so much more interesting to the other places. Especially if they're world conquerors and they decide to, hey... You got Earth, we go there, we can go pretty much anywhere and we can defeat worlds. You know? Really cool little place. Well, all those are fine and all that. You've also got two other things that sort of might be worth considering. The first, obviously, is that you've got curious humans. Basically, you give humans the ability to go other places. And all of a sudden, that curiosity factor is going to take over. They're going to be exploring the rest of the universe. And, of course, eventually other people will try to track them down back to their home planet, either to form some sort of alliance, employ humans for their own purposes, or, hey, if they've really gotten tired of seeing humans all over the universe, they're going to want to shut the place down. Hard. Usually by destroying it and all the people on it. You know, just because it takes care of so many neat little problems in one little area. And then, of course, there's those species that have learned that Earth is a great little out-of-the-way lab. Or prison. You know, it's way out on the fringe of the galaxy. Nobody's really interested in trying to track it down. So, hey, what do you say we use these humans as guinea pigs? Or something else on the planet? Or heck, just have a lab station there. Nobody's going to find it. Nobody's going to really care. So let's find this little small out of the way planet and base everything there. So, in essence, between the curiosity and it being out of the way lab, a lot of aliens sort of like Earth. Of course, the fact that, you know, it's a dimensional necklace and there's real elements there doesn't exactly hurt. So, trying to sum this all up as brief as I possibly can, honest. When it comes into the superhero genre, your ten basic tropes that you're going to be dealing with 
are, well, superhero groups that are basically getting together to pull the resources to basically take it for better defensive purposes. Um, you got the criminal organizations who have gotten together because they realize that, hey, we all pull our resources, we can pull up bigger and better crimes. Also means that we might be able to take over that little old superhero organization over across the street. Law enforcement, who can basically be used a little bit both by the heroes and villains, but generally speaking are really great for tracking crime and essentially managing everybody. The heroes themselves have a lot of really great motivations. Not only are they can they be used to as metaphors for bigger symbolic things, but they've also got their own human metaf- human motivations as well, either to test themselves, uh, s- serve their morals, some sort of academic research, or just because they want to feel useful and be part of a group. The villains, of course, can do all that, but some of them are just there to basically spread chaos, and they like just doing weird things. Others are there to test humanity. Others want to get rich, and some are out for control. And like I said, just like any other human, there can be 1,001 other motivations in there. You know, if you have somebody who wants to do petty revenge, hey, they make a great villain. You want somebody who wants to do, whose sense of revenge is spur them into greater justice? That's going to be a hero. And of course, you can also have a lot of mixing between the two. If somebody's going after justice because they're mostly out for revenge, you've actually got more of a villain. So have some fun with it. Weaknesses are a great way to trade off. They are also a great way of creating dramatic situations. If a hero has to deal with their weakness, hey, all of a sudden they've got to deal with some, you know, they've got a challenge that's unique to them or somewhat unique to the group. Either way, you've created a really cool situation. Plus, you've also implied that there is a cost to power. So weaknesses are not necessarily a bad thing. Sidekicks. I don't care if you're using them to continue a tradition, to act as a contingency plan, or just basically allow for some sort of continuation of the character. The sidekick is actually a really cool little concept if you can play around with it right. So figure out how to, you know, you don't always have to have a sidekick. But occasionally, you can do some wonderful things with them. Super Science. Try to build in, this is back to the weakness thing, to a certain degree. You don't want to disturb the status quo too much, but at the same time you want to have access to some really fun toys. So when you basically start developing your students super science, try to figure out some limitations, such as it costs too much, it requires being in that very specific location, or it needs somebody with very specific skills or powers in order to use it in the first place. It may sound arbitrary, but like I said, it can be used to effect. Bases? Hey, if you're trying to figure out a way to give your superheroes just a little bit more of a a boost, a base can actually be used really well. It can be used to train. It can be used for to maintain powers. Uh, It can be used to solve problems and do some really great research, and it gives you access to bigger toys. Better yet, it gives the supervillains a motivation to take on the superheroes, as well as, well, let's don't forget they can have their own base. And last but not least, try to develop a reason that the Earth actually is the focus if you're going to do it that way. Um, the obvious, like I said, are, you know, if it has some sort of really rare element or if it's some sort of dimensional nexus. Most of these are pretty much used a lot in comics. At the same time, like you point out, having humans just being plain old curious with the ability to play around the universe could have its own repercussions. At the very least, you're going to want people that want to hire the humans. At the very worst, you're going to have other races that want to destroy the humans. Either way, all you've got all these humans in one location. It makes an easy decision for way too many people. So... That's basically it. I hope you're enjoying this, and I'll talk to you later.